Welcome to the Profitable Happiness Podcast, where we interview highly successful workplace wellness executives, experts, and entrepreneurs, and learn how they have found success where happiness meets business profitability. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Pillay with the Profitable Happiness Podcast, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Frank Mulcahy Sr., who is an author, an international speaker, a coach, and my new best friend and advisor. <laughs> Frank, how are you doing today? I'm doing fabulous, Dr. Pelley. It's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, especially with we can talk about profitable happiness because uh, uh, so many companies more than ever need it today. No, you're, you're, you are absolutely right, and I appreciate that. And by the way, one of the reasons I call you my new best friend is because you know, and I haven't told you this, but my dad's name was Frank. <laughs> you know, I, I call him Dr. Frank. You know, I'm Dr. Pillay. He's Dr. Frank. He passed away many years ago. But there's a way that you have spoken to me and advised me and talked to me uh, in our previous conversations that have really kind of endeared me to your style. Um, and I hope that people who listen to you today can get a sense of that, you know. Um, why don't we start by you telling us how you arrived at, you know, your organization today, your business, and, and, and the Frank that you've become. Wow. Uh, well, we can go back 68 years. Um, <laughs> uh, I was born in uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts on Harvard University property. So if you hear a park the car in the Harvard Yard accent, uh, that's where it came from. I was from Harvard. And, um, but I came to Texas um, uh, in 1980. Uh, prior to that, um, you know, like everybody, uh, I had my goals, my aspirations growing up. Um, and it was all based around law enforcement, uh, believe it or not. And back during the Vietnam era, um, uh, I enlisted uh, in the United States Army. Uh, I wanted to become a military policeman so I could serve uh, people. I didn't know why, I just wanted to serve. And um, I, I did my tour, uh, came back, um, wanted to become a policeman, but uh, at that time, unfortunately, I, I was not allowed to because um, we, had, we had affirmative action. And, and for 100 years, uh, the only people who wanted to be police and uh, firemen in, uh, in the whole Northeast were Irish and Italian. Mm. And uh, that's why they called the paddy wagon. Uh, a lot of people say, where'd the paddy wagon come from? Well, that, that was Patty McDonough is going to come and pick you up when you get too many drinks in, right? <laughs> and, and, and so, uh, so I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't become law enforcement because, uh, um, and, and again, I understand diversity and, and all that, but um, one more Irish cop is not what they needed uh, back when I got out of the Army in 1973. Uh, so I, I, I took a job uh, with Travelers Insurance. Um, uh, I always had strong worth ethics, always. And um, I'll never forget um, the first year I went in for my annual raise. And, and believe it or not, and a lot of people listening to this podcast can't understand this, but the, the starting salary mm -hmm. was $6,800 a year. Wow. So that's $135 a week, right? Wow. And I worked really, really hard in the auto claims department. And the first year they boosted me up to 10000 And I said, you know, Mr. Stevens, Tom Black, Jim Stevens, never forget those two gentlemen. They set me free is what they did. Mm -hmm. um, I said to them, I said, but I need, I need 10,300. I need another $300 a year, right? About $6 a week, a dollar 20 a day. And they told me that arbitration was for ball players, and I didn't have the right to ask for more. Oh, so being frank, I, um, I gave them my two weeks notice uh, without the two weeks. I said, because of the way you treated me, uh, it's effective immediately. I left and I became an entrepreneur that day. And uh, on the following Monday, I was employed and I did uh, 26,000 uh, myself. Wow. So I realized way back then that, um, that we, we, we're still living in the greatest country at the greatest time. And if we can find a way to serve, we can find a way to uh, profit as well. Mm -hmm. And so I started that journey. Uh, and then in the, um, uh, in the early 80s, I, I switched over to uh, energy conservation um, because they had great income tax credits and, and investment tax credits and energy tax credits. Um, and then those all disappeared. They took them all away. So 
Um, being an early adopter, always, uh, Dr. Paley, always fascinated by the study of uh, 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 human behavior and technology and the convergence of the two. And so I saw the internet when it was bulletin boards, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people don't, don't understand the bulletin boards, but a big bulletin board had 600 subscribers. Uh, I get in and uh, I was the first web development company in the uh, city of Houston. Uh, built it uh, uh, before Netscape was a name. Yeah, uh, I, I love yes. the way you, you explained that because when you, if anyone thinks of Netscape, that, that'll take you back to that era. Yeah, yeah, in the beginning, right? So yeah. uh, people are always early adopters, but 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 I had that mindset that that I was there to serve. I was there mm. to serve, and, and and in the sense of the internet, I was there to serve, not to make a web page look fancy, but to make a website work functional, mm -hmm. to improve efficiency, to improve profitability, to reduce risk, reduce operating costs, and then um, uh, my lifelong goal was to retire at at fifty. Uh, so in 2001, sold the company, retired, went back to New Hampshire, um, and uh, got bored after 90 days, as most <laughs> entrepreneurs do, right? And uh, so I started buying some houses, and I figured if I bought a few houses up in the North Country, I could collect the rent, change light bulbs, and go fishing and hunting. And 57 houses later, uh, in a mill town, the mill went out of business. The economy back then in 2007 was mm -hmm. horrible horrible. Um, and, uh, I lost about five and a half million dollars. Wow. Uh, wow. broke, broke. I had to, uh, start over again. I had one house left in Sugar Land, Texas. So my wife and I packed up, we came back to Texas and, um, and I decided at that time that I was going to help provide people with life events, legal, uh, privileges, uh, for very, very affordable, less than a dollar a day. They got networked to 7,000 attorneys so that they didn't have to go through what I went through. They did not yeah. uh, have to go through yeah. because, because had I, had I had legal counsel when I set up my corporations, I wouldn't have made the mistake I made and put them all in one company. And so, um, I then found that, uh, uh, HR departments, business owners, the last thing they want to see was another benefits broker. So I went back to my core uh, philosophy. I took a sabbatical, um, I was very fortunate to be mentored by Jim Rohn and uh, Larry Thompson, and they taught me how to take a sabbatical. They taught me how to look at uh, life, to look at what we have, what we don't have, who we are, where we came from, our resources, lack of resources, what is the purpose, what is the mission, um, is this something that really is going to be fulfilling, or is this just something that's a, an economic model, right? Yeah, because yeah. I, I, I believe yeah. that if you do something um, for the good of everybody, and you second, you will benefit. Okay. But you have to put people first. And so <clears throat> I went into the benefits business and I said, identity theft is a huge, huge, huge problem. So I became a certified risk manager, really understood it as a public speaker. I started talking about it. Um, and, and I grew my, I grew my benefits business. So financially, uh, I praise the Lord. I'm back. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, something happened to me. You know, um, you know, on that, on that, on that note, before you go into to this next part here about about the benefits, you had explained to me at some point um, about a, a defining moment, one particular story that put you on the path to the benefits. And then please come back to what you were going to say. I didn't want to stop that train of yeah, thought, but I want yeah, I want you to put yeah, it in the context yeah. of that story because it was so powerful when you shared it to, with me. So, so what, so what happened was, is that, that I knew, um, I knew that had I had the legal counsel that, that we offer with our benefits company, uh, because I do people like the city of Houston and, and Fort Bend County and the state of Texas and chemical plants, casinos, hospitals. I, I, I serve all these people, but I don't serve them just with the benefit. I serve them. And I'll talk about that with the trainings that I do, but I knew that, um, I knew that I had to, I had to find a passion. I had to find a niche. I had to find something that not only I enjoyed delivering, but was needed in, in the marketplace. Yeah. And so, yeah. so the defining moment, uh, I guess that really, uh, skyrocketed my business was my uh, two grandchildren, my two grandchildren. Um, my daughter was going through a horrible marriage up in new England. And uh, I told her, I said, move back to Texas, bring the kids, um, bring the husband. If it don't work out, I'll throw him out. 
not help <laughs> you get started over. I mean, that's, that's what all good daddies do, right? Well, especially, and, um, especially Frank ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so what happened was um, my daughter came down, and after several uh, months, uh, I found out who that guy really was, and um, he was gone. But, um, but what happened was my grandkids came home, Dr. Pele, and uh, they were in the uh, fourth and fifth grade at the time. Uh, they had come from New Hampshire down to Houston. Uh, so totally different ethnic uh, mixtures, right? I mean, New England is, the state of New Hampshire is 98% Caucasian. Um, here in Fort Bend County, which we're, we're so proud of, of what we have in Fort Bend County, we win, Sugar Land wins all the diversity, ethnicity, and inclusion awards there are for cities. And it's so great because we get to know Many people from, you know, as an international speaker, I mean, I'm, I, I've spoken to people in 134 different countries over the last 37 years. And, and, I, and I think that's so important today in, in life to, to get along. But what happened was my kids were um, being bullied, right, as, as most kids do. And one was sitting at the dinner table black and blue, and the other one was given the black and blues, right? Wow. So the fourth grader held his ground. The fifth grader couldn't hold his ground. And I said to my baby, I said, I got to go to the superintendent because the school's not doing anything about this. And she said, Daddy, you can't. Uh, Fort Bend ISD is your client. You can't go in and talk to them. You'll, you'll lose your account. So I did the next best thing. I went online. I started researching. I found out I could go to Clemson University, uh, get their continued education courses, and train the trainers at the school district how to stop bullying in the classroom, right? If anything, I could help the school district at no charge because I do all my trainings at no cost. I just I work with clients. But but what happened was um, when I was at Clemson, when I said Clemson, there was a study and it said that 35 percent of the teachers surveyed said they bullied a student that previous year. Wow. And I wow. my mind just went totally wacko. I'm like, if 35 percent admitted it. Mm-hmm. What is the true number, right? Wow. What is wow. the and, and and more importantly, why? And so here's what I realized, Dr. Pele. I realized that um, the bullying problem is not the children; it's the adults. It, it's the 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 children mimic and they see what the adults do, whether it's watching the reality TV. You know, we we look at Survivor and Big Brother and The Bachelor and The House. And who? And my question to you: Who wins the cash prize most of the time, right? And it's, it's, the, it's the manipulator, the yeah. conniver, yeah. The, the, the deal maker, right? And so I, I, I searched out uh, just an incredible, incredible gentleman, uh, Dr. Gary Namey, uh, the founder of the Workplace Bullying Institute. Um, if, if it comes to empirical data, if it comes to the real hard numbers, everybody in North America at least, and he's related to everybody in the world that studies workplace bullying, uh, he has all the hard empirical data on how to stop it, the who, the where, the why, the what, the when, how they do it, why they do it, um, what are the techniques, what are the tactics, what is the damages. And so I was very blessed um, that uh, he took me in. I asked him to mentor me. I asked him to allow me to use the, the gifts God gave me as a public speaker uh, mm-hmm. to go out mm-hmm. and, and help um, help to try to make a difference, I think. in Because, again, I had two, two grandsons. One could stand his ground and one couldn't stand his ground. Yeah. And he's yeah. in a majority. He's in a majority. So I think that was the defining is that I was able to get um, the best in North America in the Workplace Bullying Institute to allow me to hook up with them to uh, further continue uh, their cause. Uh, because as, as we talk a little bit further about workplace bullying, um, it, it, it does not allow. It does not allow profitable happiness. It yeah. doesn't. It, yeah. it, 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 it's counterproductive. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I, I really, one of the things that really resonated with me about the work you do is it's heart driven. And what I mean by heart driven mm-hmm. is that you didn't just pick something and say, hey, you know, I make a lot of money over here. So that's what I'm going to do. Because you've made, you've made money. That, that wasn't your yeah. thing, though. You yeah. had... You had your grandchildren, your, your, your heart, driving this desire to keep people safe 
legally as well as, you know, in any other way from the bullying incident. I, I just think bringing a solution for life based on your true experience is a powerful motivator. And I, I, I appreciated that story. It's, it, it, it'll fuel your fire. Uh, you, you know, if you have a cause, if you have a purpose uh, and you have a passion, um, you, you know, I work with a lot of people. I, I, I do a, a lot of keynote uh, presentations on keep person of influence, mm -hmm. uh, how to take somebody and, and bring that story within them. Everybody has, everybody has a story. Everybody has something that they're good at, but they don't realize it. And, and that's a downside because um, we're in the information age. We're in the technology age. I mean, what you and I are doing now with a Zoom broadcast and, and, and you're in Austin and I'm in Houston. Yep. Uh, I mean, I could be in Sydney, Australia, and we could, we could do this communication. But, but too many people don't understand it. And, and, and it being in the quarantine com, uh, era right now, uh, I know people will see this long after the quarantine and all that. But um, it's an increase. It's an increase in the incidences of bullying, only now, instead of at the water cooler or in the, in the, in the break room, uh, it's done, it's, it's done yeah. virtually. It's social. It's yeah. Virtually. It's like everything yeah. else, you know, yeah. you know, um, I, I, I want to thank you for sending me a copy of your book, which I actually read and I, you know, we don't have, you have so many amazing stories that, sort of power all the little things that you do. Like there's always a purpose behind, you know, the things you do based on an experience. But in that light, tell us a little bit more about how you serve the people you serve. First of all, whom do you serve? Um, the, you know, who's your ideal client and how do you serve them? What products or services do you give, give them? So, um, so my ideal client, um, our corporations, I, I deal primarily with the B2B space, business to business. Mm -hmm. uh, as an international speaker, um, uh, boy, I was so honored uh, just uh, back in February um, to be the opening keynote speaker for the World uh, HR 2020 Congress in Mumbai, India. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and, and what was so fascinating about that event um, was that they take a, a, a guy from Houston, Texas and fly him over. I mean, you know, uh, it, it was 19 hours to Dubai and it's another five hours to Mumbai. Wow. Um, and, and then pay you to go on stage and, and talk about something that you're passionate about. I mean, um, but when I was there, uh, there were people from, uh, I think it was 123 different countries uh, that were represented. And, 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 you know, they were all talking about happiness in the workplace. And that was about bringing foosballs and cappuccino and making people happy. And, and, and I came in from a different perspective. I came in from uh, the perspective of um, identifying the problem, right? I mean, because if we, don't, if, we don't, if we don't recognize the problem, understand the problem, the who, the where, the why, the what, the when, how they do it, why they do it, the psychological, the physical, yeah. you can't correct it. And, 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 you know, it, it, I, I used the analogy and then when I was over there, I was talking to a very large uh, chemical company over there, uh, petroleum country. And they said, um, but we've never heard anybody here in the Middle East talk about workplace bullying. It's always happiness, happiness, happiness. But you make so much sense because you go into the root core. No, no, what you need to do, what you need to do is you need to show the, the, the staff that that mission statement in the hallway about how they care about the employees is not just some fancy picture with a great frame around it. Yeah. It's a message yeah. that they actually mean. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I try to do with my clients, my corporate clients, and usually I start with either the CEO at the top or I start with the head of HR, especially a global HR. And I try to tell them that we need to develop a culture of security, a culture of civility, a culture of respect. Because if we don't, and, and, and we have to do it, this is important. It has to be from the, the storeroom to the boardroom. Mm. There's no exceptions in between. And, and when you can do that, and people will start to understand that the company cares about this uh, uh, atrocious behavior, then, then what will happen is they're going to say, I can come forward. I can, I can bring my problem forward because one of the greatest problems with the workplace bullying culture is it hides itself in shame and secrecy. 
Mm, that's yeah. that's yeah. that's the downside. Yeah. And and, yeah. Um, and 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 if you don't, I want to expand on that just a second. When I say that it hides itself in shame and secrecy, it's on two levels. Two levels. Number one, on a corporate level, right? As hard as I try with some of the companies, and I've done everybody from the National Nuclear Security Administration, Department of Secured Transportation. These are the guys and gals that, mostly guys, ex-military, that move our nuclear assets around, right? Mm -hmm. And they were mm -hmm. bullying. So we created an online course for them because they were all over North America, not the United States. Mm -hmm. But from that all the way down to the city of Houston, it, it doesn't matter. Employees are employees. And we have to be able to let everybody from the top to the bottom know that we care. And if we do, people will start to come forward. You see, when I say it hides itself in shame and secrecy. If corporate doesn't care, then studies show, and, and, and we have some great studies on this. Um, we did one with the Houston Federation of Teachers um, uh, back about six years ago, Gail Fallon. And, and she said that um, she said that 65% of her staff had recognized and seen bullying going on. And then she asked them, did you report it? it only 15% reported it. Yeah. Only 15%, yeah. right? Yeah. And they said, why? Well, 50% said um, they didn't think anything would be done about it, yeah. right? 40% yeah. uh, said, you know, I'd be reporting it to the bully. I can't do that. Yeah, you know, you know, you know, something interesting about that is, and we've talked about this, it's some, it's the things that, that we don't see. It's the blind spots in our lives that cause the most damage. And I think one of the things you, you shared with me anyway, is that this bullying thing can be happening right in front of you and people just won't recognize it par partially because it's coming from the top guys, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's exactly that's exactly why it is, and 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 so so ninety five percent of those teachers said they wish there was a system in place that could prevent it. Now, I, I just want to uh, mention one thing: the definition of workplace bullying. Because I don't want I don't want people listening to this think, well, yeah, but sometimes you need to be able to get the job done. You know, I cover that during my talks, and 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 again, anybody's welcome to reach out, and I can send them the resources. But, but there's a there's a difference between a tough manager and a bully. Okay, yeah. but bullying is the repeated health harming mistreatment of one or more people um, by verbal abuse, threats, intimidation, work interference, exploitation. So, so there's there's actually a concerted effort as to how people are going after the individual. Yep. And uh, and people say, well, can it be a one off? Yeah, yeah, it can if it's horrific enough, mm -hmm. but usually it's the repeated uh, mistreatment and, and it's health harming. And, and the other the other secrecy is that the employee doesn't come forward. They don't come forward. But 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 can you see that <clears throat> when when a company does something very basic, very basic? Um, if they do a baseline study to see where it's at, then they can do a, a baseline afterwards to see what kind of improvement they have. All they have to do is change some of their policies, you know, and add in uh, acceptable and non-acceptable behavior mm -hmm. and the consequences mm -hmm. for violating it. Because um, here's the challenge we have. Unlike sexual harassment and discrimination, um, which are all great because we have policies, and we have laws and we have penalties and we have enforcement. But when you have something like bullying, only five states in the United States have laws against it. Only five. Hmm. Uh, 26 have proposed legislation, but only five have actually done it. And, and when you do do it, uh, it doesn't become a secret anymore. They know the company cares. And as a result of that, management, HR, can connect the dots. And if they can connect the dots, they can do even an informal investigation, if you would. But when the story starts to repeat itself, they can then make the corrective measures. But when it hides itself in shame and secrecy, they can't do anything about it. Yeah, you know, and, and, and when you talk about this, I can't help but think of another um, challenge in organizations that really just got to a, a point recently in our, in our collective lives. And that's, that's the, the Me Too movement. You know, you, you, yeah. you see how that was another similar thing yeah. that was happening in, in plain sight. But, you know, for whatever reason, it just, it, we weren't yeah. able to, 
to give it a name <laughs> and, and really get our hands around it. So I really appreciate what you're doing because who knows, maybe someday there'll be, because of your work, much more realization of this, this challenge. You know, okay. one, one thing, one thing I want to I wanna also ask you about really is if you were to go into the minds and hearts of the people in, in leadership right now, what would you help, what would you tell them to help them begin to see these blind spots, to help them begin to recognize workplace bullying? And what, how would you help them protect people? I mean, I, I know that some of the legal solutions can take you in that direction. How would you begin that conversation? So, so uh, one of the things that I do not do um, is I do not do individual counseling or coaching. Um, uh, Dr. Namey does. Um, so if we go into a large corporation, for instance, and they may have, um, you know, let me, let me go backwards uh, just for a second. Um, people say, well, well, what do we do if it's somebody at the top, right? Yeah. Well, if it's a small privately held company and the owner of the company is the bully, uh, flee. Flee. <laughs> <laughs> just for run, your own right? sake. Your own safety. Go get another job. Okay, <laughs> um, but let's 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 change that a little bit. And I've done this multiple times. When the person at the top or second level or third level, because we got this thing called ingratiation, uh, where mid-level management tells upper management how great they are, and they they pet them and they groom them and they they love it, until until senior management sits in my workshop and finds out what the true definition of ingratiation is. It's also called boot licking and, you know, kissing up and all that. Uh, but, but when they see the economic, when they see that, that, that a company with 300 employees as an average, earning $40,000 average salary, which is not a lot, right? Um, our studies show that they're losing approximately 1.4 million in unintended loss consequences. Well, when that message, Dr. Pele, gets to the executive team, yeah. they hits, pay attention. It, it hits the bottom line, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they pay attention. So, so I think we have to have a mechanism to get the message out there mm -hmm. uh, because if HR wants to bring the message, it goes nowhere. It, it, it goes nowhere. So this is why I do a lot of the public speaking. And, and, and you know, when I was in Mumbai, uh, I had nine different uh, entities from different countries uh, that wanted me to come back. Um, which I, I'd much rather serve my, my friends in the U S and Canada, uh, than get on that plane for another 20 hours. Uh, yeah, each especially in, in today's uh, current environment, right? If you can get on a plane, right? Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> I don't think but, you can, but, you can yeah. do international quite right. You know, the, the old way right yeah, now. Yeah. But, but I, but I've already got three, uh, zoom webinars set up with, uh, three of those companies, mm -hmm. uh, over there because we let this thing settle in. People are getting in. Um, because again, I, I, you know, I'm coming up with new stuff because of the quarantine uh, era. But, but when, when senior management understands that, um, then they will uh, make corrective measures. They will make corrective measures. Um, when when, uh, when HR uh, sees uh, the workshops that I do, they really start connecting dots. They yeah. said, that's what they've been doing. Yeah. That's how they got away with it. That's how they orchestrated this. Uh, and, and in my talks, I talk about the different types of bullies, the, you know, the screaming Mimi, the gatekeeper, the Jekyll, the Hyde, um, the constant critic. Uh, they all have their, their techniques and strategies uh, to manipulate uh, false uh, uh, personnel reviews. Um, it, it, it's, just, it's just so dehumanizing. Um, and and, 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 and in, in a minute, I want to talk about I want to talk about the damages that it occurs, well, uh, the well, physical and psychological. Well, well, before we get to that, remind us really what people in, in, in these leadership positions, um, such as HR and, and maybe CEOs, what should they be really thinking about with respect to this topic? Um, what should they really be looking for in order to, to solve the problems that may be just lurking underneath and, and they may not recognize them right now? What should they be looking for? It, it, it's really, it's, it's obvious. It's really, really subtle. Um, you know, um, I have a client down in South Texas that builds big offshore motors to yeah. run the big wind turbines and the pumps. And when they get a pump uh, uh, or a motor generator, 
that starts to vibrate, starts to get out of a little bit of harmonic balance. It comes right offline, goes to the shop, and it's got to be a turnaround to get back out because it's 100000 a day if that, if that turbine's not going. And, and it's amazing how businesses will take equipment that has that just subtle, something's just not quite right, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they'll do something about it. Imagine if we could do that with our humans, right? Mm-hmm. Imagine if they could start to recognize that, hey, here's Mary and, and, and Sally and Kate, and they've always been together for years, but now all of a sudden, Kate is no longer there. Kate is a little bit more mm-hmm. distant. Why? What, what, what caused that? Now, it doesn't mean that there's a problem, but maybe it's an early warning indicator. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, yeah. In, you know, maybe somebody's going through a marital situation at home. I think we need to, and, I, and, 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 and I'm seeing great progress with this quarantine, where people are now starting to care more. They're starting to get back to the tribal mentality. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, actually, I actually promote tribalism because the community, the village is what took care of people for centuries, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. then all yeah. of a sudden, we start to live in big cities like Houston and Austin and Boston, and we don't even know our neighbors no more. I mean, heck, I can go back to when I grew up and I knew everybody up and down my street and two streets either way. Yeah. Today, I don't know any of my neighbors. Right. But but, you know, I use the example in the seminars. I'll say to people, I say, how many of you gals have uh, dogs at home or cats? And, you know, typically half the people do. And I said, do you ever notice when your dog's not feeling well, you just knew it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I said, oh, why is that? Well, something subtle, something just a little bit off kilter. I said, isn't that amazing that we can recognize that in our pets and they don't have the ability to tell us what the problem is, but we just know that the problem is there. What if we could do that with our staff? What if we could be ever vigilant? And, 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 And those subtle things like that, Dr. Pele, those subtle things like that can, can save, I mean, just so much turmoil later on so much. Yeah. You know, as we wrap up, I was wondering if you could do what you did for me um, in our last conversation, which is give me some advice, right? You know, give, give our audience your, your top three nuggets of advice for, for how they can, you know, some, just some wisdom from the Frank Mulcahy files, right? <laughs> for how they can navigate this difficult topic and come out positive with profitability in their businesses on the other end. And then please make sure to tell us how people can reach you. Um, do you have a specific website you prefer? How can people get a hold of you if they want to learn more? Okay. Well, I appreciate it. And, and again, this is, uh, this, this is certainly a, a passion of mine, which is um, uh, workplace bullying behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm also, again, um, I've got three seminars today on um, identity theft and the cybersecurity risk of work from home uh, and, and how that's opened up. Uh, yeah. and so, yeah. um, uh, you know, there's so many, so many things and, and, and my whole purpose, my whole purpose is that, um, and, and Jim Rohn taught me this, uh, way back in 1981. Um, he told me that we get paid to solve problems. And if we know that we get paid to solve problems, uh, my suggestion is find bigger problems to solve because the bigger the problem, the bigger the paycheck. That's right. And so that was just a core fundamental belief that I've had since 1981. And so uh, I urge people today, especially uh, in the, uh, uh, the chaotic times we're going to go through now and in the future. I mean, we have literally hit a reset button. We're going to have more and more and more people working from home uh, because corporations are now going to understand, hey, work got done. And we also reduced our overhead on physical space back here at the home office. And so we can be uh, more lean and mean and going forward. Yeah, but we're going to lose that sense of, community. We're going to lose that sense of um, the little talk in the break room or, or the coffee room or the after work mixer or stuff like that. So I, I, I tell people, start to assess where you are, mm-hmm. but also where you're going to be and what are the challenges and the difficulties you're going to have in this transition, because this is a transition. We're not going to avoid it. We're not so, going to avoid so, it. So, so number so, one would be assess where you are right now. In terms Absolutely. of these challenges, and so you can figure out where you're going. Is that what you're saying? And, and, and number two is start to assess what additional challenges is that going to throw upon your corporation, mm. both on the technology and the human behavior, right? Mm. 
because we definitely have this convergence now. So, so number two is, is what kind of challenges are you going to have and how are you addressing them? Are you addressing them before they come up, mm-hmm. which is the best route, yeah. right? Yeah. Be, be preventive cure. We've heard it since we were little, you know, uh, yep. do this, don't do that. But, but more importantly, um, the, the, your folks will understand it. Your folks will understand that you care, that you're looking out. You're not intruding. You're not intruding. But people, people need to have that sense. And, and, and I've got a whole nother one that I'm talking about. I did it yesterday with a bunch of mortgage companies about the, the way we say things. Because it goes back to my concept about tough manager versus a bully, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The tough manager, we can send to charm school. The bully, we just need to get rid of them, right? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. the tough manager often doesn't know that that's how they're being perceived. Mm-hmm. And, and when I work with them, they say, I don't want to be like that. Well, you don't have to be. And then all of a sudden, it's just, it's magic. Yeah. Number three, I want them to understand that you can deter you can de- detect and you can defend against these hazards that are coming to the businesses. So whether it's the aggressive, abusive behavior with the workplace bullying, mm-hmm. or whether it's the ever-growing threat of cybersecurity and, and, and how, how people are working from home, yeah. uh, I've got volumes on that. But, it, but it's, it's extremely important. And, 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 and may I add just one more thing? I, I, I think this is important. Um, you can't tell the employees to work it out themselves. You can't. And that's, that's what a lot of senior management says is, hey, HR, tell them to go work it out themselves. Yeah. In, you know, five years ago, we had Jonathan Martin, uh, Richie Incognito, Miami Dolphins. Um, one was bullying the other. Uh, it got so horrific that Jonathan left the NFL. He walked out on a $1.8 million contract. Mm-hmm. A NFL player, yep. and he he ended up uh, with suicidal ideation. Uh, he ended up leaving. Uh, Richie is still playing football uh, today, and um, Jonathan uh, last year got arrested um, after the Parkland school shooting. He wasn't involved in that, but he got pulled over, and he had a knife and an axe and a shotgun in his car, mm-hmm. and it said, "When you're a bully victim and a coward." Your options are suicide and revenge, right? Yeah. It didn't have to happen. Yeah. It did not have to happen. But when you can take an NFL lineman that makes his living defending a quarterback against 11 angry, full-grown, masculine, swift athletes, mm-hmm. that's not a weak stick. But if it happens to him, what happens to the line worker, the secretary, the, the, the medical clinician, the, the, the school personnel, and, and so, again, I urge everybody, um, understand that workplace bullying is not a rite of passage. It's not. It is mm-hmm. the most destructive thing that can happen within your organization, and it can be detected, defended, and deterred if you just have a little bit of training from the storeroom to the boardroom. And I think we have a moral obligation to deliver that message. And um, so uh, if people want to reach out to me, uh, yeah. you can find me on Google. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I highly recommend they go to my YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube, put Frank Mulcahy. Uh, the first video you'll see is me speaking at NASA. Mm-hmm. Uh, subscribe to it so you can educate your staff. Uh, there's two sections in there. One's got uh, uh, identity theft videos. I'm loading out uh, probably about another 40 or 50 videos over the next month. And then there's another section I'm developing on the workplace bullying. So if you want more information on workplace bullying, um, or the easiest way to reach me is they can go to uh, uh, callfrank.today, callfrank.today, and they can hook up with uh, LinkedIn or or, uh, Twitter uh, or Facebook. Um, But uh, I can be found on on, online. And uh, and I'd I'd love to... um, to do a webinar for your, your, your firm and no charge, no charge. Yeah, no, that's great. You know, in fact, while you were just sharing some of those uh, links, I did find you on YouTube. So we'll have that in the, in the, in the show notes. So just go there, type in Frank Mulcahy, make sure you're subscribed to that. And then we'll also add your website and your LinkedIn information. Frank, I just want to thank you so much for your frankness <laughs> and for, for, for just always being a well of, of, of great wisdom and stories. Um, thank you for being on our show. 
My pleasure. And you keep up the good work uh, because um, people need us today. People need us today. And we, we all will get through it. Uh, and I think we're all going to be better off for it. I really Absolutely. do. Absolutely. <clears throat> so again, thank you and uh, God bless. All right. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Profitable Happiness Podcast. For more episodes, visit drpalay.com. And remember, get happy first and success will follow.